Her ID card listed her occupation as secretary, but when the Nazis occupied France, her real job title was shortened from secretary to secret. I just wanted to write this book so badly because I just fell in love with her. I just fell in love with her character. At the height of World War II, Marie Madeleine Fourcade led the largest and most influential resistance group in France, despite the fact that she was young and a woman. She was not your normal French woman. She had, by all accounts, an amazing aura of authority around her uh, that, that just made people want to obey her. She was also very charismatic. The accomplishments of Madame Fourcade's network of spies is impressive, and the dangers they faced gathering their intelligence breathtaking. She looked on her agents as if they were her own children. So when, when they were arrested and when she found out that they had been killed, um, it just devastated her. It, 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 she talked about what one time she talked about it, it felt like she was wielding an executioner's axe every time she crossed out the name of, of one of her people. Um, but she kept going. I mean, that's, that's the extraordinary thing is she kept going. Yeah, as I was reading the book, one thing that kept occurring to me, I was sort of asking myself and wondering if readers and perhaps even the author asked themselves this as you do it, is would I do this? Exactly. Would I, could yeah. I really do this if I was put in that position? What do you think? Do you think you could do it? Now, Marie Madeline's unsung heroism is finally being celebrated in a new book that reads like fiction, but is based on fact. It's Madame Fourcade's Secret War. It's an amazing story. <laughs> And you will hear that riveting account directly from the author in this edition of First Person One-on-One -on -One with Lynn Olson, sponsored by St. Louis County Library and HEC Media. Lynn Olson, welcome to St. Louis, and thanks for being with us today. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. Before we get to the specifics of, of this book, uh, you've written a lot about that time period, World War II. What is your, your attraction to that as a writer? I grew up never thinking I was going to be a historian. Um, I spent the first 10 years of my career as a journalist, a, a, a print journalist. Uh, and the first book I wrote was with my husband, and it's called The Murrow Boys, which is about Edward R. Murrow and the, and the correspondence he hired to create CBS News. And that was before and during World War II. Um, and we did a lot of research in London, because that's where Murrow really made his name, uh, reporting from the rooftops of London. Um, and I fell in love with the period. I fell in love with the period. I fell in love with the place. Um, it, to me, there was, there is, and was no more exciting, dramatic, important time uh, than 1940 and 1941 in Europe, because we're talking about Hitler invading Europe. Hitler really threatening Western civilization. The French really, uh, they sort of let the Nazis just kind of roll in and, and take over without much fuss. Why were they so complacent? There are a lot of reasons for the French, for the incredible uh, quickness in which the, the, the Germans conquered France. First of all, you have to remember that France was decimated in World War I. They lost 1.6 million young men, um, in, per capita probably the worst of any country that fought in, in World War I. Um, and so they were absolutely determined. Um, not to have to go to war again. Um, th I mean, the, the sense of, of, of uh, just horror at the idea of, of facing another war was just endemic throughout the country. And France has always been a very kind of divisive country, politically divisive, and it, it was tremendously divisive during, between the wars. Um, they, were, they were facing the Great Depression, they were facing Hitler coming to power, um, and they just were not, re they refused to acknowledge the fact that they may, in fact, have to do this again. Uh, and when they were faced with it, they decided, OK, if we're going to have to fight another war, it's going to be like World War I. It's going to be a defensive war. It's not going to be an offensive war. Well, there was this robust resistance movement. And, and I have to confess, uh, in, in reading your book, uh, before that, I, w w I was picturing, I don't know, people down in, in little tunnels in the ground or, you know, almost sort of Hogan's heroes or yeah. something. Uh, these, these were like corporations. They were so big and so many employees, so to speak. By 1943, um, there were 
lots and lots and lots of resistance networks throughout the country. They, 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 and they focused on various things. They focused on intelligence, which is what my heroine did. And, uh, in other words, collecting intelligence, sending it to the British. Uh, there were others that focused on sabotage, um, subversion against the Germans. Um, but So they were all over. And they varied in size. Hers was, was one of the largest um, resistance networks in the country. I'm not sure what circles one would run in to expect to be recruited to <laughs> lead the resistance, but whatever those are, I don't think she was necessarily running in it. How did they no, find her? No, it's it, it quite by happenstance. Um, she, she married this army officer, had two children immediately, uh, decided that he was not for her because he wanted her to be the typical French subservient wife. She, that wasn't her. And so in her mid-20s, she left him. And uh, they, they had, he was based in Morocco. And, and she left Morocco, took her kids, and went to Paris, where she joined this you know, smart set of young women. Um, she got a job. You know, she did all the things that young women weren't supposed to do in France back then. Um, and then one day in 1936, when Hitler was beginning his threat against uh, uh, Europe, um, she went to a tea that her brother-in-law and sister were giving and uh, met two military officers, one named Charles de Gaulle and the other was a, 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 a major named uh, Georges Lustineau Lecot. And uh, she caught Le Lustineau Lecot's eye and he basically recruited, he was also, also he was an intelligence officer but he was very anti-German and he knew what the Germans were about to do. Uh, and so he recruited her in this kind of quixotic private campaign to learn as much as they could about the German army uh, and, and the preparations the Germans were making. And so she became, you know, it was kind of an unofficial intelligence network. And so, so she became part of that. And that continued until the war broke out and he uh, rejoined the army and was sent to fight. Um, and he was injured, long story short, he came back and they went to Vichy and together formed, began to form this infant uh, intelligence network. So she's leading this, uh, this huge resistance network, one of the largest, if not the largest in France at the time, uh, as a woman. Right. Uh, that must have been extremely difficult. It, it, well, it, it was extremely unusual. She was, it, she was the only woman ever to lead a major resistance organization. And she herself, um, was very hesitant when her mentor, uh, who called himself Navarre, his code name was Navarre, uh, said he wanted her to be uh, the deputy. And uh, she said, but, you know, I'm young. I'm, she wasn't even 30 years old at that point. And, and you know, all these military men, are they going to, you know, are they going to follow me? And, and he said, yes, they'll follow you. Um, and so that's how she got involved initially. But she was uh, initially she was very hesitant because she did think that I mean you're talking about military guys who you know the idea of a woman being in charge is just um, you know anathema. But she was a very unusual woman. Um, you know she was again young. She was beautiful, but she had by all accounts an amazing aura of authority around her um, that that just made people want to obey her. She was also very charismatic. Um, I talked to the uh, son of one of her top lieutenants uh, last year, and he said, you know, if you walked into a room and she was there, that, that's all. You just paid attention to her and nobody else. She just had this. She just had it. Um, and she also was, she, as, her, as his deputy, she trained a lot of these agents. She trained them in how to do what they were doing. She trained, trained them in coding. She paid them. She provided... Um, room and board for them. She, you know, she, she was the arranger. She was the administrative person. Um, and so they really got to know her and they got to know how incredibly good she was at this job, despite the fact that she was a woman. Um, and so little by little, uh, by the time she actually did become the leader, um, especially the younger ones, they trusted her. You know, they believed that they, she was the chef. She was the, the, the chief. Were there times when her being a woman was actually an advantage uh, as far as creating some sort of deception? I think so, yeah, especially in the beginning. I mean, because the Germans came from the same kind of traditional conservative society that the French came from, they, they also had trouble 
uh, accepting the idea that women could be spies or saboteurs or whatever. So uh, women, especially young pretty women, um, had an advantage because, th at least again in the beginning, th that changed, but in the beginning the Germans, uh, you know, just thought there's no way that they, they could be any, could be trouble, so they could get a lot, away with a lot more um, than, than others can, M men could. Paint a picture of, of just how big this network was, and they moved around a they lot, moved obviously around, they yeah. had to. Yeah. It started out small, but it spread. It started in the south of France, which was called the Free Zone. That was the that was Vichy France. It was supposedly free because uh, the Vichy government, the legal government of France, was in charge. But in fact, the legal government of France was being controlled by the Germans, and the Germans tightened screws more and more and more. But at least initially, it was not as for, for the resistance. It was not as uh, fearsome as in the north, in the occupied part of France, which included Paris. Um, so she started, it started in, in southern France, and that, that's where the, the first set of agents came from. But soon it spread throughout the country. It was in every part of France, in every major city, in every medium-sized town. Um, and at, basically there were about 3,000 agents, which is, which is really large. And I have, to, I have to stress that these were not professional. They weren't professional spies. Most of them were just ordinary people, you know, people that um, might have access to information about the Germans, but, um, you know, was, weren't trained to do this. So, in other words, like shipyard workers, bus drivers, fishermen, uh, housewives, uh, plumbers, uh, artists, you know, I mean, it just the, it ran the gamut. Um, and they were doing it because they wanted to get their country back, and they, you know, they wanted to get the Germans out, um, and they knew the risks they were taking. But uh, that's what's so amazing to me is that they accepted those risks, um, which were fearsome, and and uh, kept going. Yeah, as I was reading the book, one thing that kept occurring to me, I was sort of asking myself and wondering if readers, and perhaps even the author, ask themselves this as you do it: Is would I do, do this? Exactly. Would I? Could yeah. I really do this if I was put in that position? What do you think? Do you think you could do it? I don't know. I, I'm not sure I could. I mean, you, you know, you are you are putting everything at stake. You are putting not only your own life and your livelihood, but your your families, the people around you. I mean, it the the dangers and the risks were so overwhelming that I, I'm not. I'm amazed at how many people who took that, took those risks. They weren't a lot. I mean, if you look at the French popula population as a whole, most, most French people did not resist. And, you know, quite frankly, how can you blame them? But it, more than 200,000, probably well over 200,000, did take that risk. And uh, many lost their lives as a result. I mean, it, it's extraordinary. Well, and there were times when, I mean, ultimately the organization was successful, but it was almost decimated. It was decimated guys. over, almost, almost decimated over and over and over again. And it, it was she who, who kept it together. She kept cobbling it together, you know, whole sectors, you know, for example, the whole sector in Marseille is wiped out or, you know, in Vichy or in uh, Bordeaux or, you know, and, and she kept finding people to go in and, and resurrect it. And it was really em emotionally uh, traumatizing for her because she was very close to the people. She didn't know all 3,000, but she knew a lot and she was very, very close to the people that she w was surrounded by. And it, it was agonizing for her. She, I mean, she looked on her agents as if they were her own children. I mean, there was a really um, very strong family atmosphere. Uh, in that um, network, and so when when they were arrested, and when she found out that they had been killed, um, it just devastated her. It, 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 she talked about what, one time she talked about it. It felt like she was wielding an executioner's axe every time she crossed out the name of, of one of her people. Um, but she kept going. I mean, that's that's the extraordinary thing is she kept going. And the the group kept running around, she kept running around. One of the things, I guess, that she had going for her, perhaps because she was a woman, was she became this sort of master of disguise. Yes, yes. She, she, she changed her hair coloring many, many times. She had various false identities. Uh, she even had, you know, various, um, I mean, it wasn't, they didn't change her face, but 
prosthetics, like a dental prosthetic that she would put in to look like somebody else. She would wear glasses that would make her very unattractive when she was really a beautiful woman. Um, and so I, I think that, that helped uh, a lot in, in, in her being able to elude the Gestapo until, you know, 1944 when she was captured by them and it looked like she wasn't going to away. Not much was known about her and perhaps even about Alliance until your, your book was put together, but uh, of all the things that we should know is some of the things that they accomplished uh, during their their uh, reconnaissance, so some some significant uh, things, particularly with regard to D-Day. Yeah, um, and there, there were really, well, there's so, as you say, there were so many contributions that they made in terms of the intelligence that they gave to the British. Um, three in particular. One was uh, finding out a, a lot about the German submarines that were decimating the, the British merchant shipping. And it was vital for the, the British to know what the sub, where, when the submarines were leaving the ports and when they came back, etc. And she had a lot of people in the various submarine ports on the coast, the, the Atlantic coast, uh, who, who were reporting. And, and, and thanks to them, um, many submarines were sunk by the British, uh, which is hugely important. Um, she also, um, sh she had agents who found out a lot about the V2 and V1 uh, terror weapons that Hitler used on, on England. Um, it, they, the intelligence, they said, didn't stop them, but they, delayed, they were able to delay them. The, when the British got this information, um, they were able to bomb, um, you know, the, the, the uh, experimental station. And so they delayed the um, building and the, the use of those bombs, which was incredibly important. But as you said, one of, uh, perhaps the most important intelligence they gave was to, ha, has, had to do with D-Day. Um, Alliance had a uh, subnetwork in Normandy uh, with, with a number of agents. And obviously they didn't know where the Allies were going to land. Nobody knew except the Allied planners. Um, but this particular sub-network, in fact, lived, um, worked um, on, on the beaches where, in fact, the Allies did land. Um, and they, the leader of that network, sub-network, was an artist. And he put together um, thanks to his own intelligence gathering and the intelligence gathering of the people around him, he drew a 55-foot-long map showing every gun emplacement, you know, every beach obstacle, uh, every machine gun nest, every road uh, on Utah Beach, Omaha Beach, and the beaches that the Canadian forces landed on. And you can just, a 55-foot map, that's hugely long and detailed. Um, and it was sent in a uh, burlap sack, huge burlap sack, in March 1944, smuggled out of France, uh, taken to England. And so the planners had it three months before uh, D-Day. And the morning, two mornings after um, it left, the, the map was sent, um, this artist and the, the people that worked with him were arrested by the Gestapo. And on the morning of D-Day, uh, just as the guns were, set, were beginning to sound, the Allied guns, um, signaling that it started the invasion, they were taken out and killed uh, by the Germans. I suppose it was inevitable, but of course uh, it did happen that uh, there was a traitor in their midst. Yeah, th th there were a couple, but there was, there was one major traitor who, who betrayed hundreds of people in the Alliance, including her Marie Madeline's lover and several other top people. Um, that, that, was just, that was part of the risk, and, and all the networks experienced it. You know, the larger you got, the less secure it was, because you, you really couldn't verify the, ide you know, the, the, the uh, identity of uh, many of the people. So th there were a lot of German informers and German collaborators who managed to get in, in, into these uh, resistance movements. And, and unfortunately, this guy really uh, did wreaked, wreaked tremendous damage on me on the network. And the job of executing him ultimately fell on them. Yes. And it didn't go well. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, there well, I guess were, it there, depends there were, how you look at it. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, there were several informers and one, yes, one they did. One alliance, the agents uh, were told by the British to execute him. And, and it was, I go into detail in, this, in, in the book how, yes, it was a botched operation. They couldn't kill him. Uh, he kept not dying, and, and finally they did accomplish it. But it, it's kind of like a Marx Brothers comedy, even though it was, you know, it was not funny at all. But they eventually got rid of that one. And, but the, then there was another one that, 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 they, that was caught at the end of the war, after the war. But meanwhile, he was responsible for the deaths of many people.
So little was known about Madame Fourcad uh, prior to, to your book. I'm wondering how you got the information that you were able to come up with. Um, I got the idea for her be from uh, my previous book, the pre book I wrote right before it, which, had, which was a much bigger topic. It was about the countries of occupied Europe, and, and I focused a lot on the resistance movements in those various countries. And I came across her um, just mentioned briefly in, in books and journals and, and other resources. And, um, and she is in the previous book, but only a couple of paragraphs. I was just so fascinated by her. And I thought, why don't I know anything about her? You know, why, has, why don't any of the histories of French resistance go into greater detail about her? Um, she wrote a memoir, which I, which I later read, but, but the, 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 the history books about the resistance don't really talk about her. So I thought, my goodness, you know, she deserves a book of her own. So that's, that's why I wrote it. As part of your research, were you able to talk to any of her uh, relatives, descendants? I talked to her daughter, her, the daughter that was born after the war, who, uh, who was the one who talked about her mother not being all that maternal. But she also talked about how Marie Madeleine, it was so important for her to stay close to the people that she had worked with um, during the war. Um, and, and the survivors, not all of them obviously, there were, there were hundreds of survivors, but those that she had been closest to would get together every month. And, and they would go out to dinner and they would do, and, and, the, and their children remained very close to each other. So her, her children, um, her surviving children, are very, very close to the children of her top lieutenants and others. I mean, they're like brothers and sisters. I mean, it really was a family to her. And she spent most of the uh, time after the war in helping uh, the survivors um, emotionally, materially, economically. She, she badgered the French government to give them, um, you know, pensions, etc. And she also helped the, the wives and the children of those who had died. Um, and spent a lot of her own money on, on doing that. So she, she felt really responsible for these people and what had happened to them. And obviously she was, uh, I don't know if outspoken is the right word, but at least she talked about her experiences because as you know from covering this period yourself, so many people who were involved in the war at various different levels never wanted to talk about it after right, the war was right. over. She, right, she, she wrote her memoirs, and, and, th and they were very important. But, you know, I think she, one of the reasons she slipped into the shadows is because she was a woman. I mean, um, the French resistance was just as sexist as the rest of French society, and, and the male leaders, and they were all male except for her, um, really didn't want women to be in high positions in, in their organizations. They were the leaders and the women were supposed to do the subordinate work like uh, being couriers and being liaison agents. Those, those jobs were incredibly important and they were incredibly dangerous. Um, but, but those women never really got the, the credit that the men did. And, you know, after the war, well, actually during the war, General de Gaulle and the Free French created this organization uh, of heroes. Uh, they, it's called the Compagnons de la Liberation, and it was supposed to be the major heroes of the French resistance. Um, and there were 100, uh, 1,038 chosen. That's the number of the t several hundred thousand people who were in the, in the resistance. 1,038 were judged to be heroes. And of that number, 1,032 were men. Six were women. And, and she was not included among the women. So, you know, I think it has a lot to do with her, with her gender, uh, that she is not better known. Well, it must have been galling to her also because not only just not being recognized while she was doing the work, you know, to have the, the recognition have, have come forward to do it, but then to have accomplished so much and not be recognized for it after. I think it probably was. She, she never admitted that. She w always, when she was talked about uh, what had happened, she always talked about her agents and what they had done and the risks they had taken and the contributions they had made. It was always, it was never on about her, it was always about them and how important they were um, for, to save, for saving the soul and honor of France. And they really were, they, as, as were the thousands of other resistance members uh, who, who risked everything. Is there a sense of satisfaction for you having written this book? that you are bringing some attention to her story that had so long been ignored? Oh, a tremendous sense of satisfaction. Yeah, yeah. I, have, I like to write about unsung heroes in my books, and she certainly is an unsung hero. And uh, I, I want to give her the credit she deserves, and I think I have. 
Lynn Olson, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. She saw bemetalled Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe officers dining on the best food and wine that Maxims had to offer. As she passed them, she thought of her shabbily dressed agents, who often had little to eat, risking their lives to get rid of the men in that elegant room. Marie Madeleine took a secret delight in the appreciative stares directed at her and Nellie. What would these Germans say if they knew she was leading a network that was plotting their destruction?